Gail on her way to breed. And by the way, spotted salamanders are one of the most impressive uh, salamander species out there. Um, I mean, first of all, they're gorgeous, right? All black with bright yellow spots and fairly large. I mean, we're talking about a six inch long salamander, uh, but they are also the only photosynthetic vertebrate on the planet, which what that means is that they can actually take sunlight and turn it into food energy, which no other animal with a backbone can do. This is something that's pretty much reserved just for plants. Um, and the silly part about this superpower of theirs is that they actually never really get to use it in, unless they're a tadpole or what we call a larvae. Uh, because they spend the rest of their life underground or only come out at night in the springtime. So they don't really see sunlight much except for when they're juveniles, uh, but it does help them grow much faster when they're that young. But anyway, this was my first time seeing this salamander. Um, I had been flipping rocks and logs and searching for all sorts of creatures when I was a kid and had never seen this species because she lives so far underground and only comes out at these special times of year. Um, and as it turns out, she wasn't the only one that was out moving on these nights. So I quickly learned that if I go out on warm, rainy nights in April, I can get rewarded with uh, spotted salamanders. It was like establishing this like reward pathway, like go out into warm, rainy nights, get salamanders and like reinforcing that behavior. Uh, but it wasn't just her or these species that I was seeing. There were also wood frogs, for example, and wood frogs as humble as they may appear, are also one of the most incredible amphibians, not only in this area, but on the planet. This is the northernmost amphibian in the world. It can extend all the way up into the Arctic, uh, the, yeah, excuse me, the Arctic Circle, and they can freeze about 80% solid. Their heart will literally stop in the middle of winter, and they can survive that to come back croaking in the springtime. Actually, they sound a little bit like ducks or chickens. They, they cluck more than croak, really. Uh, but an amazing species, and it's that special superpower that is what is helping direct scientists to learn about how we can survive deep space travel. Because if we need to travel to another galaxy, we need to learn how to freeze ourselves or like somehow survive this like hundred or thousand year journey or more. So how do we do that? Maybe we can freeze ourselves much like a wood frog can, which if you're wondering how they do that, they basically fill their cells with urine. So uh, maybe that's the direction we have to take. Who knows? But a uh, very cool species and um, certainly uh, very neat for that special ability. And in my opinion, very handsome as well. I mean, like they have these like cute little black masks where they look like they're going to a masquerade ball, which in some ways that's basically what they are doing. I mean, they're going to mate in these vernal pools, um, which by the way, if you're not familiar with vernal pools, these are temporary bodies of water where they can breed fairly safely and not worry about like fish, for example, eating them. Um, but when they're in these like pools mating, they can actually form these like literal balls with each other where they like are like rolling around with each other and like trying to uh, usually access like this one female that's in the center, this one poor female. Um, so if you look in a vernal pool at the right time, you might be able to see that spectacle. And then there's the blue spotted salamander, which is another vernal pool specialist here in the state, but uh, they are very closely related to the other spotted salamander that we saw earlier. However, this species has some of the most complex genetics of any animal on the planet. They can hybridize with all sorts of different species of salamanders. It's something like five or six species they can just easily make a hybrid with, and then they can also essentially clone themselves. Um, basically, there's this all-female lineage where uh, they can like steal genes or sperm from other species of salamanders and then just produce an identical copy of themselves. Um, and by the way, their genetic information, they have genomes that are about 10 times the size of our own. Uh, just incredible species. Uh, like, for example, we have um, uh, two sets of chromosomes in our genetics. A blue-spotted salamander or a hybrid of a blue-spotted salamander can have two. They can have three, they can have four, they can even have five different copies of their own chromosomes. So uh, really amazing species that I still don't entirely understand how all these things work. But um, also they look like a, a starry night painting, right? Like just a, a beautiful species. And then of course there's the spring peepers, which you certainly hear on warm rainy nights in April, but uh, many people actually may not see them because they're so tiny. I mean, this is the smallest frog species in the Northeast. They're about the size of your fingernail, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and if you see a pebble on a road during one of these warm rainy nights, odds are actually pretty high. It could be a spring peeper. Um, and you might find them like sticking to your windows if you have lights on in your house or something like that as they try to eat the bugs hanging out around your lights. But 
uh, very neat little species. And uh, these are not a vernal pool specialist like the previous three that I had mentioned, but uh, they will breed just about anywhere. I mean, they might breed in like plant pots or something like that. They, they're not too, too picky. Um, but there are plenty of other species that are moving on these nights. There's actually about a dozen others that we can see moving on these nights. And when we get so many animals moving at once, that is what we call a big night. So to put it into words, it is a spring night when you have a large simultaneous migration of thousands of amphibians, or it could be hundreds or dozens. Uh, it's kind of like subject to like whatever scale you're looking at, like are we talking about your backyard or your town or, uh, you know, whatever scale is relevant. Uh, and if you take a look at this bucket photo, I mean, you can really have some explosive movements happening where like this was possibly over the course of just an hour where somebody was monitoring a spot and helping frogs and salamanders cross roads and uh, they have at least three species in here so see if you can pick out all three while I keep going here uh, but why are big nights so explosive it has to do with the fact that amphibians are some pretty sensitive species they first of all can't produce their own body heat so they need to rely on some heat from the environment around them uh, but they also are this bridge between land and water and uh, that essentially means that they have to be around water. Otherwise, they dry out really quickly. So we need a few things to come together in order for them to feel safe to move. So first of all, it needs to be springtime because that's when they breed here in Maine. And it tends to be like mid-April when we get our biggest big night movements. Um, I was just talking with Carrie Ann before everybody had uh, joined on. But we had our first migration movement last Thursday night. And I'm looking at possibly Saturday as another movement, but we get our biggest movements typically early to mid-April. And it is moving earlier, by the way, with climate change. Um, the ground does need to be thawed. And this is really important because we get those like warm days in like February and January where like it can be randomly 50 or 60 degrees. And if an amphibian took that as a hint that it's time to move, they would probably be in dire straits the next day when it drops down below freezing. So when the uh, ground is thawed, that means that there's been a lot of time, a lot of sunlight, a lot of warmth heating up the ground and getting the ice out of the ground. And I, I will say some amphibians, they do move on those warm, like full spring days. Like uh, there have been a few videos this year of spotted salamanders, like walking across snow, even getting like covered in snow as they make their way over the ice. Um, so not everyone follows that rule, but it is a, a useful one that many of them do follow. It needs to be raining as well. Um, again, it needs uh, amphibians need wetness in order to survive. Otherwise, they can dry out. Um, and it doesn't need to be a lot of rain. It can be a mist. It can be a, a light rain. It can be a downpour. Um, as long as the ground is wet. And that's why I'm really curious to see how Saturday goes, because it seems like the rain is going to stop right before nightfall. So I'm going to see if amphibians will still move, because the ground will still be wet, and it's going to be really warm. So... Theoretically, they should be ready to move, but um, I, I do recognize that they seem to get pulled out a little bit more if it is actively raining, so we'll see how it goes. And then temperatures need to be about 45 degrees Fahrenheit to get a good movement. We do see movements all the way down to freezing, so uh, wood frogs, for example, again, super cold tolerant species. I have seen them moving at like 32, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, but the higher the temperature, the more you're going to see. I mean, Saturday, we might even have temperatures in the 50s at night, so it could be a really good night. And to put this in context for you, just how amazing, how big these migrations are, um, if we correct amphibian weights for like the distance that they travel and compare that statistic to like other wildlife, uh, for example, woodland caribou, woodland caribou are migrating 400 miles. That is essentially the equivalent of how far a frog is traveling to reach its breeding habitat, which is just amazing to think. Like over the course of a night or two, these wood frogs are traveling something like 400 frog miles to get to where they're trying to go. These migrations are also 13 times greater than that of the wildebeest uh, migrations in the Serengeti, which that is one of the most popular wildlife migrations in the world. If you've ever seen a wildlife documentary, you've probably seen videos of wildebeest like trying to cross a river and avoid being eaten by a crocodile or something like that. Imagine that, but 13 times greater in your, in your backyard, under our noses. Just fantastic to think about. Amazing. And uh, in true terms, a, a frog may be moving about 3,000 feet. So 
about 400 frog miles or 3,000 people feet, I guess, to reach their breeding habitat. There was a really cool study done on wood frogs by some folks at the University of Maine where they strapped these like tracker backpacks on them to see how far they go and like what routes they take. And they found that some wood frogs will actually go over the tops of mountains to come down on the other side to get to their preferred breeding habitat. So they seem pretty mobile and uh, very willing to go over some pretty rough terrain. However, it didn't take long of me following these amphibians to realize that a lot of them are ending up like this bullfrog here, where they enter the roadway and many of them are getting hit by cars. Uh, and it wasn't just like one or two, it was dozens and dozens and dozens. So uh, over the past few years, I've been doing a lot of research into how roads are affecting amphibians. And just to give you some statistics, and these are just a few statistics, this is just stuff that I, I think is useful and easily understood. There's plenty more out there about how amphibians are being impacted. But uh, one example, there were 30,000 amphibian mortalities or deaths um, recorded on a single road in Canada over the course of four years. That was primarily one species, uh, the northern leopard frog. And you can imagine how devastating that must be to the populations that exist there. That's 30,000 over the course of four years. That's more than any other vertebrate that's getting hit by cars. I mean, could you imagine like 30,000 deer or even 30,000 mice? Like it, there's, it's hard to imagine so much roadkill going on with any other group of animals. The likelihood or the probability that an amphibian gets hit by a car is about one in five on average. So if I were to tell you that if you were to step out into the road uh, next to wherever you are and cross it and that you had a one in five chance of being hit by a car, would you take those odds? Probably not. Now, a lot of these amphibians are crossing roads not only once, but twice a season because a lot of them have to cross to get to their breeding habitat and then return back to where they want to spend the rest of the year. So we're talking about a one in five chance twice a year, uh, but that can vary a lot depending on a few things like traffic. The more cars you have on the road, the more likely you're going to be hit. So some areas just have such high traffic that there is a 100% chance of being hit by a car. Um, other roads, if they don't have any cars traveling on them, tend to not be very deadly. Um, other things like how many lanes or even the width of the road. Um, different barriers around the road, the habitat types around the road, all those things can really affect how deadly that road is. And then uh, for those of you that like digging deep into biology and especially genetics, there's some really interesting evidence out there to show that frogs and salamanders are becoming so separated by a single road that they're essentially turning into what is basically like different species. They're just like separated for so long that their genetics are starting to show differences from each other. Um, so if you think back to your, your high school biology classes, how a, a species is formed, you have to have these two groups of animals and have them be separated for really long periods of time. And like if their environments are different, different traits are going to get selected for. And you might end up with two totally different looking species over time compared to something that like was similar when you started. Um, we're starting to see that with amphibians here in Maine. Um, this fact is actually based on a study out of UMaine, where they found that on either side of the I-95 corridor, frogs and salamanders have different genetic compositions now. They are genetically distinct from each other at some level, and that's only going to continue getting worse unless we do something about it. So um, to continue my big night story, I just gave you the background on big nights, why they're important, what's happening with them. This is where I'm at now mentally, where I'm in high school, I'm in college, and I'm going out and uh, either dragging my mother out to make her drive me around or going out with friends and finding these different road crossing spots around where I live and where I went to school and basically just having good time. Like, you know, we'll drive around and see a salamander, be like, oh, cool, spotted salamander, get out, take some pictures, hop it across the road. Um, but I was realizing that this is still a persistent problem where amphibians are being hit by cars, but I can't be everywhere at the same time. There are roads essentially all over the place in the United States, right? And I can't be on all those roads helping amphibians cross. I mean, maybe I'm making a difference in these little spots where I'm actually surveying, but is that really contributing to the overall uh, conservation of these species? Perhaps not. So I'm asking myself this question, how do I make this more effective? because roads are everywhere and I can't be. So I start asking myself, can I make a project where we can get people out on these roads, start surveying, and maybe hopefully create these long-term benefits 
for amphibians. So what you're seeing here is the first time I organized a big night event. This was my senior year at Unity. It was 2018. Uh, Unity is the, the college I went to for my undergrad. Um, and there's only about a dozen of us. It's uh, a few students and professors. And I was the president of the herpetology club, which herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So I'm like, you know what? I've been studying reptiles and amphibians for a few years. I'm the uh, president of this club. This is a, a great time to give this a try. I mean, I've been wanting to do this since I was seven. Like I had thought of like trying to get other people out there helping these things for over a decade at this point. So uh, this was a perfect opportunity for me to give it a shot. And it was actually interesting enough that we attracted some media attention. Um, those of you who uh, might remember Bill Green's Maine, they came out to do some film with us and they came out pretty bright eyed and bushy tailed thinking that we we're going to be getting dozens of amphibians. However, Mother Nature was not on our side that night. It was about 38 degrees Fahrenheit and dry as a bone. Uh, we were expecting a real downpour of rain, but I was watching the, the radar on my phone and just the clouds were going right around Unity. It was just like as if there's this barrier in the sky. Um, so we were missing all the rain. It was getting colder and colder. And then finally, after some time, we got a little bit of a drizzle. And um, I mean, at, at this point, we had almost given up. Like the, the camera crews were getting really um, antsy and like we weren't seeing anything. It was cold. We were... Uh, you know, just not not having a great time. Right. But the drizzle started and then it actually started becoming a little bit of a, a rain and the ground was getting wet. And then finally, after I think it was like two hours of surveying, I heard somebody say it, wood frog. And there was the star of the project. This was probably the wood frog that saved us, honestly, because this gave us the morale to not only keep going, but also got the cameras interested. We got a story about Big Night published because of this little male wood frog making his way to the vernal pool. So here he actually is on the front page of News Center, Maine, that same wood frog. Uh, just such a, I'm so thankful <laughs> for this one particular wood frog because he really did keep us going out there. Um, so we got all these cool shots of like the wood frog making his way to the pool and like different students like collecting data and us like regulating traffic as it went by and stuff like that. And then we were out there longer, so we ended up seeing more species. So, for example, we saw like the spring peepers that started moving and then blue spotted salamanders. And then we got great shots of people helping these things cross the road. So we ended up with a great story that I think really saved the project. I mean, if that didn't happen, I don't know that I would have had the motivation to continue this after that. So 2018 was the first time I had organized a big night and it was a success. We recorded 49 amphibians. It was a pretty good night. We had four sites that we surveyed. We had about 12 volunteers. I don't have a great record of that because it was my first time running this and I did not do a good job of keeping record of everything. Uh, but it was only focused on the area around Unity. So this is something to keep in mind for the next step. Now, the problem coming after 2018 was that I actually graduated that year. And by the way, I don't know if anybody here would recognize the fellow here on the right uh, that's Jeff Corwin. He was the, the graduate speaker, or sorry, not the graduate speaker, graduation speaker uh, for my class that year. And I, I got to connect with him. Um, for those that don't know Jeff Corwin, he used to have uh, TV shows on Animal Planet and Discovery. And I got to talk to him about my big night projects as well as uh, turtles and whatnot. But the problem was that I'm graduating. I'm leaving Unity. I'm not going to be here to run this project in the same place anymore. So what happens now? Do I somehow come back to unity and run this every year for the rest of my life um i asked myself what if i made this statewide there's no other big night project out there that is statewide even today a lot of them are just focused on a town or even a county uh, but not statewide and I, I knew going into this this was going to be pretty bold because nobody had really done this before uh, but what you're looking at is a map uh, one of my first maps I ever made of all the different sites that I started identifying around the state that could be good for monitoring for amphibian migrations. Uh, those little white lines are like sections of road that I'd started identifying. So I needed to find a way to make this statewide because I no longer was in unity. I was in a different part of the state. Um, and the, again, roads are everywhere. Why would I just focus on one little section of the state? But I needed to figure out how to even know where to look because I mean, Maine doesn't have a lot of roads compared to a lot of states, but there's still more than enough roads to keep somebody occupied for probably years of searching. So I needed to narrow down some way to know where to send people. So um, one of the first ways I, I used to 
identify sites was through the Maine Significant Vernal Pool uh, Program, which is a really cool program run by the state where they identify vernal pools and uh, will publish online the GPS coordinates of all these vernal pools that they've evaluated. So I got to go in and use these GPS coordinates to find out where vernal, pool, vernal pools were and if they were close to roads. So I would um, like poke around and like look and see, okay, like there's a lot of vernal pools here. There's one like right next to the road here and use that as a way to identify sites uh, for the project. So uh, this is in Brunswick along Durham Road and you can see all those white circles are where vernal pools have been identified. So I placed a bunch of sites, those pink lines there, they're all about a thousand feet long. I, I standardized all of our sites to be the same length um, so that I can identify these spots to tell volunteers to go to in the future. And I did a few other things to find sites too, but that was the primary way where I identified, I think probably two to 300 sites uh, right off the bat doing this. Uh, but I did realize though, that running this as a statewide project was gonna be probably a lot to handle because again, this is not uh, something that is a career focus of mine. This is a side project. So for example, when I was starting to make this statewide, uh, I was working for the state doing turkey trapping, um, pretty preoccupied with that. Also raising my daughter who she was not even a year old in this picture. She's now uh, three, almost four years old. And then I was also starting in the fall as a graduate student where I'd start doing my PhD work. And then on top of that, could I handle running a big night program? How do I make this possible, <laughs> right? Like this is a lot to handle. So what I figured out would be probably the, the most feasible thing would be to do a very like hands-off style project where I don't tell people when and where to go all the time. I just like identify all the information for everybody else and let them digest it for their own purposes. So I made this a self-guided experience where I just provided oversight to make sure that people are learning and being safe and um, giving them rough guidance here and there. But otherwise, it's, it's self-guided. Like you can come in and pretty much choose your own adventure with Big Night. Um, so volunteers train themselves. I do run some in-person trainings here and there. I haven't this year, but in previous years, I usually run one or two just because some people seem to really like it. But for the most part, people train themselves. You collect data whenever and wherever you can. Uh, you do have to go to the predetermined sites, but otherwise it's whenever you're available. And then I uh, figured out some ways to automate processes. So for example, like data submission forms, data quality control, um, the quality control of the submission forms has been a big one where we have basically uh, created a quote unquote app uh, based on a, a different software that exists out there where you can download the data sheets to your phone and like collect data, fill out the sheet while you're like out there serving amphibians. And when you submit it, it will tell you if something looks wrong on your data sheet, if something needs a correction or whatever. Um, and that has saved me so much time and improved our data quality so much. Uh, and also too, Part of the feasibility of this is leaning into the idea that this is a community science project. It's not just my project, it's the project of everybody who's participating. So creating a community means that I get to not only relax, take a little backseat and let like other people answer questions and help each other out, but let people also use their skills to help improve the project. Uh, so for example, um, uh, digital artists and like engineers and mathematicians and, um, students, like all these different backgrounds have contributed to the project in different ways. Um, and how I've pulled the community together to do this to help support the project. Social media, the biggest one. Facebook, we're probably the most established on there out of everything else. Uh, but also talks like this, right? Bringing people into our circles. Um, but I like to try to pull as many different people into this project as I can. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be a science student. You can be three years old. You can be 99 years old. Whatever your background is, you probably have something valuable to produce for this project. So that's the idea of creating this community to help make the project run. So to summarize 2019 for the project, we recorded 376 amphibians, which is a big jump from 49, right? That was how much we got in 2018. We surveyed 18 sites. We certified 23 volunteers. And we established this idea of being a statewide project. We were no longer just in one town. We were in about 18, give or take. Um, this was also the first year that we established this uh, charter or like set of goals for the project, because now that we were starting to create a name for ourselves, I figured it was time for us to make sure that we had direction. 
Uh, so the goals of the project, which we're going to revisit later, so make sure, make sure you remember these, are as follows. Number one, identify the significant and vulnerable amphibian migration routes in the state. Where are amphibians getting hit a lot? Where are the species of concern? Uh, what would be a good place to put like a, a wildlife crossing culvert, for example? We want to provide direct relief of road mortality on amphibians. So not only uh, helping them across the road, right, but also putting in things like these culverts that I just mentioned, and we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, but that's the that's the big part of this, though, is like getting out there, getting people actually scooting these guys across roads so that hopefully over time we actually get some uh, population benefits for these species. And finally, we want to provide an opportunity for community members to get out there and experience nature and not only experience it, but how it's studied and how it's managed and be a part of that process, because it's just such a great thing to be a part of. And I don't know if everyone here has been a part of a, a community science project before, but it is really cool to see your data result in real world changes for these animals, which is something our data is currently doing for these species. So 29, uh, 2019 wraps up. We got good statewide coverage. Uh, however, here comes 2020 and everything's looking good until the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and it hit right when things were about to kick off. In fact, you probably remember, it was March 2020, about three years ago, uh, that everything shut down. Amphibians were just starting to move, and then suddenly we, meant, we might not even be able to like get out of our houses, right? So how do we manage a community science project in a world that looks like this, where we're technically not even allowed to be next to each other? Um, well, as it turns out, it was a pretty easy job trying to figure this out because a community science project outside meets a lot of these requirements. So, for example, it's outside. You're not cramped up in a space with other people. You're spaced out. You, if you want to go out with a group of people, you can do so very easily and maintain social distancing. Uh, a lot of the people that went out were doing this in small groups and not large groups. But everyone was looking for a way to get outside. So I was asking myself, can I still run this project and make this an opportunity for people to get out there and experience things. And in, as it turns out, it was a great opportunity. And I, I just want to mention one other thing before I go to the next slide. Um, I almost didn't get to uh, run this because I, there were so many um, uh, comments coming from like the governor's office, like, you know, don't go out, don't, you know, stay inside, all that. Um, there were some things about like, you know, maybe going outside, it's okay. So I'm trying to get like approval at this point from the government to run this project. Couldn't get in touch with the mills office, but I did reach out to the commissioner of IFNW through Instagram. I sent her a DM on Instagram and asked her if I could run this project that spring. And she gave us the approval as long as we maintained space. And uh, so special thank you to Commissioner Camuso for that one. Um, so it, it ended up being a really good year for us. We, we got an immense boost in volunteers. We got insane media coverage this year, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, special thank you to Brandon Keem. He's a, a nature writer out of Bangor, and I think he was the one that really drew attention to the project, not just statewide attention, but national and international attention. So thank you, Brandon. Um, we got interviewed by the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Company for radio. We were highlighted in the Atlantic. And then Brandon's article, which was about the new, uh, which was in the New York Times about our work. Um, and his article was covering this big finding of ours, which was a product of what was uh, or is now being termed the greatest natural experiment of our um, of our lifetimes, because people were inside for a lot of 2020. So nature responded very differently. Uh, you probably remember stories of things like wolves and deer and boar like wandering through cities or like songbirds like singing louder and closer to cities or like whales changing their migration routes like all these different ways that like nature responded to less people being outside. Uh, we had a very similar experience and this is again what uh, pretty much all these media pieces were about which was the fact that we found a big difference in how amphibians were getting hit by cars during the pandemic. Basically, what we found was that half as many amphibians were killed on the roads because there were so many less people driving. The lockdowns happened right when amphibian migrations were occurring. So there were about 50% less cars on the road during amphibian migration season than normal. So we had about a 50% drop in amphibian road mortality, which was fantastic. So a lot of people have been asking me since like, 
Are we going to see a, a change in the populations because of that? I'm not sure. I'm a little bit of a pessimist on this because by the time summer rolled around, traffic resumed to normal when the juveniles of all those that had made it across were going to be crossing the road again. Um, so they would be facing pre and post pandemic traffic levels. So normal stuff. Um, so I mean, maybe there's going to be a benefit. This would actually be the year that we start seeing the benefit because um, anybody who survived that three years ago, wood frogs take about three years to start breeding. Uh, so we might see a boost in wood frogs this year. And if we do, I'm certainly going to report it somehow, some way. Uh, spotted salamanders probably need another year or two before they start showing up to breed. But um, it, it could be. I mean, I, I've got my fingers crossed that we have a little bit of a population boost coming, but um, I'm not entirely sure that it is there. Um, other findings, though, from the same paper, this is completely unrelated to the pandemic, just some other interesting responses that we saw. Frogs are much more likely to get hit when it's warmer than salamanders. Why that is, we don't know. Just as the temperature increases at night, more frogs get hit, but salamanders, doesn't matter what temperature it is, it just stays the same. The same is true for rain, where as the rain picks up at night, frogs get hit more but salamanders don't. And we just, we don't know why. <laughs> it's really tricky. And I've tried figuring this out. And if anybody has any ideas, please feel free to pitch them. But we've dug into everything we could think of, including like maybe when it's warmer and rainier, frogs are like jumping and like getting hit by bumpers of cars and not just tires or something like that. And we just haven't been able to pull out the uh, effect as to what is happening there, but interesting nonetheless. So to sum up 2020, we surveyed uh, or sorry, recorded 1,600 amphibians. So remember, 2019, we only had 300 something. 2018, we had 49. So we're up to 1,600 amphibians being recorded now. 69 sites surveyed, 87 volunteers certified, and we gained national and international recognition. We received some financial gifts, which was really great. So we got our first scientific publication out of the project. This was a really productive year for us. Now, um, community science projects are supposed to be for everybody, right? It is a community science project. But what if somebody can't access the project for some reason, be it that they live far away, uh, there's no sites near them, or maybe they can't find the gear that they need to participate because we, we require all volunteers to have high visibility vests and headlamps to maintain safety. So what if they can't find that stuff or what if they can't afford it? Well, as I just mentioned, we received some financial gifts in 2020 and that allowed us to put together these really awesome participation kits where we basically bought like a ton of headlamps and safety vests and clipboards uh, and actually ID sheets as well. We were able to commission Mike Boardman. He is a, a wildlife artist out of Cumberland uh, or Yarmouth, I believe. And he made these fantastic ID cards for the project where we have all the species of Maine included, except for the mink frog. We just couldn't find room for it. And the mink frog is the least likely amphibian you're gonna encounter on these nights. Uh, but they're life size and they're waterproof. And we have some really cool pictures of like spotted salamanders being on there, like lining up perfectly. Um, and plus the fact that they're waterproof means you can take them on big nights with you. They've got measuring uh, rulers on the bottom to get some like precise measurements of the things you're seeing. So really cool um, pieces of work. You can buy them at coyotes.com. I believe there's something like between 10 and $15 a piece. And uh, proceeds do come back to the project from that. So uh, please feel free to not only support Mike Boardman's work, but our work as well. Um, and we included these in these kits that we sent around the state. So all these stars reflect where we have kit hosts. Uh, we do have a bit of a, a desert of kit hosts in central Maine, where I'm hoping to get some folks at Bangor and Waterville or Augusta uh, to host some kits. But um, if you need any equipment, all of this is available free of charge. You just have to return it by the end of the season. And you do have to be a certified volunteer to check this equipment out. Uh, but you can check out, if you're certified, you can check out like equipment for your kids, for example. Um, and we have like child size vests. We have adult size vests. We have all sorts of different things that are available. So if you need anything, we got you covered. Now, uh, also coming up, we noticed that uh, there were some interesting things happening with our amphibians. In fact, uh, these photos were from, I believe, 2019 and 2020, where we were finding frogs that were just like balloons. They were like filled with liquid. And we thought at first that these were females that are just full of eggs. So we we're like, yeah, like this is so cool. These are going to be like super females producing tons of eggs for us. Well, as it turns out, these are actually diseased animals and they're diseased by road salt. 
basically the salt that's placed on roads gets washed into the pools where these animals are breeding. That increases the salinity of the water to the point where these frogs can't regulate their own water properly. So remember, amphibians have very thin skin and they need to absorb water all the time. So when they get in these salty pools, they're absorbing a lot more salt than their kidneys can actually regulate. And that makes them essentially balloon up with water and uh, they become pretty immobile. I would imagine it's also pretty painful too, but um, they're not able to move well, they can't mate, so they can't like escape predators or cars or anything like that. Um, I don't know what the actual mortality rate is of frogs that get diseased like this. I mean, hopefully after they get out of the pool, they uh, can get to some like cleaner water, especially in rain or something like that. And that just allows their bodies to re-regulate properly. But um, this is something that we are recording. And as far as I know, we are the only people who have recorded this in spring peepers. It is well known in wood frogs at this point. Uh, but if you happen to see any frogs like this, please take a picture, send it to us, let us know the location. We've identified a few hotspots around the state, including Camden, Gray, um, and I believe a few sites in York. Uh, but it seems to be like these sites that are like on the cusps of civilization, um, where there's like a, a, a good like population center for people, but like it's right next to the woods. So like Camden and Gray, both great examples of that. Um, so keep your eye out and please submit any sightings that you may have. So 2021, to sum up, we recorded 5,700 amphibians, so just increasing a ton every year, uh, 185 sites surveyed. And remember, 2020, we had only surveyed 69, so we had almost tripled the amount of area that we had covered. We certified 316 volunteers. We distributed participation kits around the state. We hired an intern that year. She did some mapping work for us, which was really cool. We created our custom ID cards. We started tracking those new diseases there with the uh, the frogs and salt. And then we got even more media coverage, including my favorite so far, which was on NPR. Um, I don't know if you listen to um, All Things Considered on NPR in the afternoons, but I got to hear Ari Shapiro say my name on national public radio, which was pretty cool. Um, so we just have continued growing as of 2021, just insane growth. So proud of the project so far. Now 2022 comes around and the project is turning five. This is a classic midlife crisis moment for many long-term science projects where scientists like take this five-year mark and ask themselves, are we doing what we intended to do? So this is a great time to review the goals of the project and make sure that we are accomplishing what we set up to do. So first of all, we're helping amphibians cross the road, right? We're, we are relieving road mortality. We're getting people participating in natural resource sciences. I mean, you've seen how many volunteers we're cert uh, certifying every year now. However, are we identifying the conservation priority areas, those significant and vulnerable migration routes? Are we identifying those yet? And my answer to that was no. We are five years into this project and I don't even know where the deadliest roads are or where the best roads uh, would be to place a, a culvert like this. Uh, so if you've never seen these before, these are wildlife crossing culverts. A lot of you have probably heard about these or heard about like the overpasses that like go over roads. Um, and these are awesome, but they are expensive. I mean, the materials aren't too bad. It's probably in the range of like thousands to maybe at most $100,000 for the materials. But for the labor, we're talking about millions of dollars per uh, tunnel installed. So it's important that we know where we're putting these tunnels because it costs so much money. And I will say there are some almost like hilariously bad examples of people placing these things and they end up not doing anything. So for example, there was a, an overpass constructed somewhere out west or possibly in Canada um, where it was constructed to help things like uh, deer and elk and mountain lions cross busy highways. But over the course of several years, the only animal recorded crossing over that overpass was a squirrel. Probably cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build that thing. So it's important that we know what we're doing with the placement of these things and also make sure that they're designed properly. And we've learned a lot about how design influences things for amphibians. So like if you look at this top right one, those slots on the top where it can let like water through and sunlight and um, also the ground too, looks like it's a natural ground and not concrete. Those are huge difference makers for amphibians. They like that like natural, like wet soil field. They will not want to cross through a dry concrete tunnel. So how do we decide what sites get tunnels? We can probably look at the most obvious thing, which is how many amphibians are being killed. Uh, so for example, these are gonna be the deadliest roads that we've recorded so far. 
We have Durham Road and Boyd's Corner Road in the southern end of the state. So we're looking at 60% and 64% mortality rates. Um, then we have Center Road and Gray, 65% mortality rate. Thorndike Road in Unity, 70%. So seven out of 10 amphibians are being hit by cars on that road. And then Forest Avenue in Orono, there's 12 sites along that stretch that all have about a 70% mortality rate. So very deadly up there. But is mortality rate the only thing that matters when we're looking at these sites? So for example, if we went out and surveyed a site and we found only one dead frog and nothing else, that site technically has a 100% mortality rate. 100% of the animals we found were dead. Uh, but is that a statistic that we can reliably use? Like what if somebody has only surveyed for 10 minutes, right? Like there are all sorts of things that we need to consider uh, to make sure that we're putting these really expensive tunnels in the right places. So for example, other things, are rare species present? Do species or uh, sites that have like blue spotted salamanders or spring salamanders or northern leopard frogs, do they get priority over sites that don't have those species? How many amphibians are actually being recorded there? So for example, again, back to the one frog problem, do we put a tunnel in to save one frog, whereas we could put a tunnel in maybe, you know, a couple miles away where there's thousands of frogs? Uh, it's important to know just it, not precisely how many are there, but proportionally speaking, like, are there a lot of amphibians that are available to be saved in these different sites? And this question, too, this is like the, the train problem where, like, if we have like the, you know, your friend is like on one train track and like there's like three people on the other train track, like which way do you like send the train, right? Like this idea of what populations do we save? Are we gonna try to concentrate on the ones that will survive if we save them? Or do we concentrate on the ones that won't survive if we save them? Um, like, it, is there enough to persist into the future? Or like, what if a population could exist without a tunnel? Do we want to put one there to help them anyway? Or do we focus on these other spots? Um, and then also too, are each uh, sites being surveyed enough? Is 10 minutes of survey enough to decide to put a multi-million dollar tunnel in? Or do we need a little bit more time? And to answer that question, uh, the number I've been using is about one hour to two hours of survey time to have any level of confidence. We need at least an hour. So here's a map I put together of uh, our 2022 data to kind of get the cogs turning in your brain about where we might want to put these tunnels. So the size of the circle is indicating how many amphibians were recorded at that site, and the color is indicating how many are dead. And a lot of you have probably already noticed that the area around Bangor and Orono has big circles, and a lot of them are red. And if you're wondering why that is, if you've ever been to Orono, you probably know that it is a big swamp. Um, there's a lot of wetland in that area, and that means that there's a lot of amphibians, but it is just on the outside of Bangor and also has the University of Maine in Orono with, you know, 10,000 students there. So even though it's a fair, fairly rural town, it has really high traffic. And again, coming back to that idea of how many cars are going down a road is going to change how many are getting killed, uh, but it's a rural town. It has a lot of amphibians left, so it seems like it could probably be a pretty good spot to put some sites. And then draw your attention to, to the southern end of the state, where a lot of the circles are really small and a lot of them are actually red. Populations here are small and getting very reduced. Uh, this would be an area where we'd have to be urgently looking to put tunnels in if we want to save the populations that remain. Uh, so uh, just in case you're not super familiar with Maine geography, the southern end of the state is the most populated and there's a lot of cities and urban development. So it's important uh, to think about how amphibians might persist in these areas and whether or not we want to put uh, tunnels into these places to help them cross roads. So uh, I'm about to show you the 30 top sites. You'll see like stars appear on the screen here um, that we are recommending to the state for in installing tunnels. So all those blue stars are where we think tunnels should go based on the different types of data we've analyzed, like rare species or mortality rates, survey time, um, all the different factors that I mentioned before. So we have a lot that we think we sh uh, should go into the Bangor Orono area. Um, Unity, uh, we have one down, uh, sorry, one up here in, I think, Calais. Or, no, uh, not Calais. Uh, is it Loopback? I always forget what town that is all the way up in uh, Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge there. Uh, but even getting down to Portland, Falmouth area, um, couple in Brunswick, couple down in York County. So we have a pretty good spread of where we think some tunnels should go. Um, this is now in the state's hands. Hopefully we start seeing some tunnels installed soon. 
I don't know how long it's going to take, probably be a couple of years, but I know the state's also interested in trying to use these same sites to try to help other wildlife cross. So for example, if some of our sites we proposed are also good for things like moose or bear or deer, they might try to install a bigger tunnel of some sort. So it could be that there's a multi-use tunnel installed at any one of these locations. So 2022 in summary, 8,500 amphibians recorded. This was, again, just another record-breaking year for how many amphibians we were seeing. We surveyed 246 sites. Just to remind you of our humble beginnings in 2018, we had surveyed only four. So we're up to 246 sites being surveyed in 2022. Uh, 361 volunteers certified, and we identified those top 30 sites for tunnel placement. Uh, this was the first year we started using that app that I mentioned earlier, where we're collecting data and submitting it through our phones instead of having to record it on paper data sheets, which you can still do if that you know matches what you like to do. Uh, but the app has just been wonderful for collecting data. So to total up everything over the past five years, coming into our sixth year of the project, we have recorded 1,600 or sorry, 16,000 amphibians around the state. We have put in over 2,000 hours of survey time, which is 91 straight days of survey. We have surveyed 318 unique, unique sites around the state. So all those little dots are where we have surveyed around the state. So clearly we have had great coverage through the southern and central sections of the state, getting up into the Western Mountains a little bit, uh, getting into down east as well. And basically this outlines where civilization is in Maine. I mean, we have big gaps in like Aroostook and like also Washington County, but there's just not a lot of people there anyway. There's not a lot of road to survey. So I'm actually really proud of this. And by the way, draw your attention to the northern end of the state. We have had surveys done all the way up there in St. Agatha. So uh, we are in Aroostook County. Um, and if you happen to be calling in from Aroostook County, I would love to get more surveys done up there. But um, I'm really proud of our volunteers and how much coverage we have actually given the state. Um, by the way, we're estimating somewhere around thousands of people have participated in this project so far. It's kind of hard to get a number on that because uh, people bring out their friends and family they don't always you know record who's with them um, but we know we've had you know hundreds of people certify on this project now and they've all almost certainly brought somebody else with them so uh, we're estimating that you know, it could be a thousand to two thousand maybe three thousand people have participated in this project so far all of this from an idea that a seven-year-old kid had like I've known I wanted to do this since I was seven so um, really just so proud and happy with this project and everybody who's contributed so far. Um, so what's next for the project? We're going to continue our research focused on predicting where wildlife road mortality hotspots are. Um, social influences of the project, I'm really excited to dig into like how uh, people's minds have changed about nature because of this project. Uh, amphibian diseases, not only including the salt problems, but also things like ronavirus and chytrid fungus, which are really big diseases for amphibians how amphibian populations are doing in the state, um, how reliable our data is. We have a professor from UNE who's gonna do some really cool like controlled experiments where he puts, um, basically he's collecting dead amphibians as the season goes on and he's gonna freeze them and then put them in the road for volunteers to find and see if they find them or not. Um, that's gonna give us an idea of how reliable our data is. We're also going to do uh, targeted surveys where we're focused on um, spring salamanders, for example. That's a species that we have rarely seen for big nights, and we actually didn't even know they came out on big nights until about a year ago. Um, so we're going to keep trying to assess that rare species, especially because they are declining and might actually be out of the state in a matter of decades. So it's important that we do keep an eye on that species. We're going to continue annual surveys. We're going to continue trying to increase access to the project. And I like to pitch this question to everybody, which is, what would you like to see? Because this is a community science project. This is your project as well as it is mine. So please let me know what you would like to see in this project. Um, so that is everything that I'd like to share with you today. Just, I, I'd like to thank everybody who has contributed to this project. I, I saw a few names in the audience today that I recognize as being volunteers. So if you were a volunteer for this project, Thank you for your data, your time, your patience with everything. I know sometimes it's slow going and we have like bugs here and there with different things, but um, this project wouldn't be here without you and all the other people have supported this project in different ways. So I have a, a really lengthy acknowledgements list. Uh, please take the time to read through that. Uh, otherwise, if you want to stay in touch with us, please join us on Facebook or Twitter. Our website is there. Our email is there if you have any questions or comments. Uh, but please feel free to submit some comments now or questions in the chat, and I'm happy to answer them. But uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to me rant about this project of mine.
All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, I also just want to share that uh, Herring Gut Coastal Science Center and the Georgia's River Land Trust have adopted a site. So if you are interested in joining us on a big night, um, you can go to herringgut.org um, and register and we'll send out um, kind of what happens is when we think there's going to be a big night, when the conditions are looking great, we'll send out um, an email a couple days in advance to that list. And then as it gets closer, we'll send out another email um, to confirm. So we went out uh, last Thursday and saw some wood frogs and um, we're looking forward to the next big night. Um, we do have a couple questions here in the chat. Um, so Greg, what is the website to see the established vernal pools? Um, that is on, I believe either Maine DEP or Maine uh, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I know there's like a, a main quote unquote geo library. So like if you're into like GPS points of all sorts of different natural features, you could probably find it there as well. Um, you can download like a, a Google Earth file and view it with Google Earth there. Great. Um, and um, I had a couple of questions as well. So I was wondering if um, vernal pools, are they almost like species specific? Is there competition between um, amphibians to get to those, those vernal pools? Or can you find multiple species in one pool? Yeah, so the great thing about vernal pools is that because they dry out every year, that makes it really hard for other amphibian species to use them. So some of our most competitive amphibians, like green frogs and bullfrogs, where they'll eat anything that shows up, they can't survive in a vernal pool because they need at least two years of water to grow from a tadpole to an adult. Um, so that reduces competition a lot. There are three species that will use vernal pools, but there's really not much competition happening between those three. Um, so as far as those three are concerned, they're pretty peaceful with each other. Nice. Um, do you focus only on sites that are across roadways? Um, and if so, what can we do to help protect, you know, vernal pools that aren't, um, you know, across a roadway? And um, what can we do to help those sites as well? Yeah, so my project does only focus on areas that are around roadways, but there are other programs out there to protect vernal pools that don't have anything to do with roadways. So for example, if, if you own property and you have vernal pools on your property, you can get them surveyed and established as significant if they meet certain conditions. Like, first of all, it needs to be established that it definitely is a vernal pool. Um, and then they'll look for different species. Like if they have fairy shrimp or any amount of blue spotted salamanders in there, it automatically gets coverage as a significant vernal pool. And that makes it so that if anybody develops or like harvests uh, wood products around the pool that they have to like maintain a certain percent of canopy and like not disturb the pool and stuff like that. So um, that stuff does exist to pr uh, protect vernal pools, yes. Cool. Um, and if someone lives along a roadway and they know they see frogs and salamanders crossing, um, they may not know if it is a big night site, but what can they do um, to make it become one? Yeah, you can reach out to me, send me an email at that email there, and just let me know what you saw and where you saw it, and I would be happy to register more sites for sure. Great. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, feel free. You can unmute yourself um, if you would like. It looks like something just came in. Um, so Deborah wants to share that this is her second year volunteering with Maine Big Night at a site in St. George, and she can attest that it's really rewarding and fun, and she's learned a lot. Um, she does have a question about their use of flashlights when surveying. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we need them for identifying amphibians and for our own safety, but are the frogs and salamanders bothered by the light? Should we try to avoid using the flashlights more than absolutely necessary? Great question, Deb, and uh, thank you for your two years of service to the project to it. You were one of the names I recognized. Um, so this is something that we have talked about in the project a few times, and we haven't really been able to come up with a great answer, but what we do know is that frogs have some of the most sensitive eyes when it comes to light in the animal kingdom. They can see single photons of light. Um, 
But does that mean that the lights that we use are damaging their eyes? We don't entirely know. So a few things that you could do. Um, you could try to re reduce your light use with these species, especially like, you know, maybe not putting the light directly on them, but like off to the side. So for example, actually looking at this spotted salamander, that's what I did with this guy. Like I tend to put my light off to the side and like illuminate them that way instead of like a direct like overhead light. Um, you can switch your light to red, uh, maybe like have, oh, excuse me, a bright light like for uh, traffic to see you. But um, if you need to actually look at the animal, use a red light. Um, otherwise, though, <clears throat> a, a way to, excuse me for a second, I'm going to drink some water. Here's where my throat is finally starting to go. It made it through the whole talk, though. So um, a, another way to think about this, though, is it's a very temporary um, amount of light that they are receiving. And as far as we know, there is no damage that's being caused to them. It might be painful to their eyes, but you are getting them out of the road. You are saving their lives. So if it's something where, like, you're debating on whether or not you should even be out there helping these animals, I would definitely say, you know, they could probably put up with some temporary, like, blindness from bright light and, you know, survive. Uh, there's no indication that they receive any permanent eye damage, no permanent blindness, but um, it is definitely something that we do like to be conscious of. So whatever you can do while being safe, go for it. But I, I wish I had, like, solid advice on there, but sadly I don't. All right, thanks. Okay, if there's no more questions, um, I just want to share, um, as far as community science projects go, um, Herring Gut and George River Land Trust are also collaborating on a watershed community science project focused on the St. George River. Um, so our study sites flow from inland freshwater to coastal saltwater. Um, and our next event will be at Eagles Way Preserve in Warren on April 22nd. So if you would like to learn more about that, um, you can register at herringgut.org. Um, don't forget um, that our online auction is now going on. So if you go to herringgut.org, you'll see a bright orange um, online auction button that you can click. Um, and Greg, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing your knowledge. And thank you everyone for joining us and sharing an interest in the amazing migration of amphibians in Maine. Um, a quick reminder that if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider leaving a donation um, and keep an eye out for next month's Learn, Discover, Grow on April 25th at 7 p.m. Um, and thanks, everybody. And thank you, Greg, again um, for such a great, a great talk. Um, we did yeah. have one quick question um, that just came in. Are you serving sites um, that are not significant but are significant VPS? Oh, uh, vernal pools, but are definitely vernal pools. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They don't have to be significant. They can, they, it can even be any wetland. It can be a marsh. It can be a stream. It can be wherever amphibians are moving. Just, I use the significant vernal pool program to find my sites initially. So, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody. All right. Thanks, Greg. Good night, everyone. Good night.